Hey designers, welcome to a new episode of Uniquely Designed. I'm your host, Mario J. Gray. You will know the truth and what you know will set you free. Some of you think that I'm only skilled in music and that I'm not sweet on the basketball court as well. I, and if you think that, you're probably right <laughs> because I'm not skilled or sweet on the basketball court. But the one that I'm talking to today is both skilled and sweet on the basketball court. Um, she is a native Kentuckian or Grange, Kentucky, and her span of influence spans all the way back to even her high school days at Odom County then goes to her now alma mater, uh, Tennessee State, where she served under, played under legendary Hall of Famer, the late Pat Summit. She served at Western Kentucky University and then uh, Kansas, and then became assistant coach um, at the women's basketball team at University of Kentucky uh, under coach uh, Matthew Mitchell. Then as destiny would have it, uh, she is now the head coach of that same team that she was once assistant in. If you haven't figured out who I'm talking about, I'm talking about Coach Kyra Elsey. Coach Elsey. This is a great conversation and I want you to miss it. I want you to go ahead and text someone, call someone, tweet someone, send them the uh, send them the link so that they can tune into this conversation that's more than just about basketball. It's about how destiny allowed her to be in all these different spots and how she's been uniquely designed for this moment. And if you haven't gotten tickets yet, what are you waiting on? Go ahead and get your tickets. We want to make sure that you're in the stands and that you're there and we're cheering on what's going to be a great season ahead. So without any further delay, let's hear how she has been uniquely designed for this moment. Let's go. Hey everybody, y'all know who I have with me once again. I am honored to sit down, Zoom with um, uh, Coach, y'all need to know. If you didn't know her, you need to know it. You've been under a rock somewhere. Those of you in Kentucky, you already know there's no better coach probably in the entire state. Y'all know that. Uh, but I want those of you who are not in Kentucky to know her. So will you help me welcome Coach, Coach Kyra. That's not what they call you. That's not what they call you, though. I'm calling you that. What did they call you? Coach LZ, was it? Yes, that's what they call you. Coach LZ. See, let me tell you this before you say anything. First of all, I want to just give you a disclaimer in case you didn't know it. Um, I didn't play basketball growing up, so... Um, I will not make any references to any shots. I will not make references to any plays because I will not be shamed by anybody who's listening today. So I am just interested in you as a person and what you do. But welcome today. How are you doing? Well, first, thank you so much uh, for having me. It's okay that you didn't play basketball. If you would like to come over to the facilities, I would be honored to teach you a thing or two about basketball. I think I can handle that part. I don't know if you can teach someone who is uh, has no coordination skills. Um, the only, you know, I, I went to go, um, I started I took up recently uh, golf and um, when I was golfing, um, the trainer was asking me, you know, they say, you know, like when you were younger, when you play basketball, I was like, they say, you know, when you were younger, when you played baseball, I was like, they say, you know, like when you were like, she named like all these sports. And I was like, I said, I play piano. And she said, all of my examples are sports related. She said, you're going to have a long journey. I said, I know, because I have nothing to relate this to at all. Uh, so I wanted to start today and just ask you, one, how does it feel just to sit in the seat that you're in now? Um, those people who have been following you and, of course, know that you've done so much outside of just this uh, particular role. But. Uh, when I went to a an event that was hosted by one of the local pastors uh, here in the city, your pastor, actually, Pastor Gaines, um, and his son, Micah, and you said um, you thought that it was going to go one way and like you were supporting and like, all right, we're going to do this and we're going to prepare. And then you got the phone call that changed everything. And now you're sitting in the seat of something you weren't even trying to get. How does it feel just to sit in the seat? Because there are a lot of people that are waiting to get into a seat, you know, and, and have plans to, but you weren't planning to get in that seat. So how does that feel? 
you know, I'm honored. I am blessed beyond uh, what I deserve. And I said at the event that you attended, God truly works in mysterious ways. Um, I knew I would become a head coach. Um, I never thought it would be how it happened. Um, but that's the funny thing about God. Uh, it's not on your plan or your agenda. It's his. Um, so he felt like the time was right. Uh, and Kentucky was the place. And it has been an unbelievable journey. Um, I've learned a lot about myself. Um, there are some things that you do not know about the seat until you sit in it. There, there, it's the best teacher experience. Um, but I wouldn't want to be a, the head coach at any other place. Yeah. You're a native of Kentucky. Um, so, um, we have home court advantage because you're, we're both native Kentuckians. Um, so how do you feel that, um, as it, you're serving here in your, of course, your home state. Um, but do you feel like there are things that when you look back and see how your life was lined up, um, that you can point back, you know, I remember, um, I heard a mentor say one time before, uh, that faith leaves clues. Uh, you look back and you see how things were being orchestrated over the time. When you look back, do you see how things were just strategic, strategically pointing you in the direction you didn't even know you were going, going to go into? Absolutely. Well, basketball, I started playing competitively um, in fifth grade. Uh, so, um, you know, funny story. I had ADHD before they really had a name for it. And so school really was not not my thing because you had to sit down uh, too long and uh, focus. And so now I'm telling my age, but it was one of the science classes where they had like the, you know, the black tables. And so the science teacher was going over. I don't know what, because I had been sitting too long. So I started playing hangman with my eraser on the blacktop desk. Well, anyway, they were like, we're going to kick you off the basketball team. Um, and my mom was like, they, they will not kick you off the basketball team. We went to the dollar store. She made me get all these cleaning supplies. I had to clean all the desks. And she was like, she will play basketball. And that was the moment that I realized, you know, that I had to take school serious in order to play basketball because I loved doing that. And then, you know, from that point on, um, I was blessed to have so many people pour into me um, in order for me to follow my dream. So I, I would say from that moment in fifth grade, all through my playing career, there were different people along the way, you know, that invested in order for me to sit in this seat today. And you talk about um, your mom and education. Uh, there are a lot of people um, in different areas outside of basketball who feel like I can do this without. Did you ever feel like I can do this without or because of what your mom instilled earlier? You were like, it's going to be both and <laughs> not either or. It was not an option for either or. And, you know, my family was really big on um me get an education. They were like, you can play basketball, but basketball will end and you will need something to follow up, uh, fall back on. And it was funny, my friends, you know, they would get $10 for an A or $5 for a B. And I would ask my, my uncle, you know, my aunties, my mom, and they were like, we're not paying you for something that you sh should do. That's expected. Um, but I will say, uh, I was spoiled in other kind of ways. Uh, so when I graduated, you know, I did get the car. So they spoiled me with big milestones. But the little things in between, they were like, that's expected. So that was instilled in me at a young age. Well, I was what you call a colorful student, um, which meant that um, I believed in diversity at an early age. I diversified my grades in many ways. So um, I was never, uh, I was never, um, uh, racist with grades. <laughs> I was always, I believed in diversity. So I, I had all types of grades. I would have loved to have been paid. <laughs> I, I, I would have loved to have been paid too. They didn't pay me. And it was funny. Um, I got to college and, you know, your freedom for the first time uh, away from my mom, away from my family. 
And um, my first semester, I think I had like a 2.5. And Coach Summit called me in and she was like, I am going to call your mother because I know this is not the standard that she has set for you and you're better uh, than what you're showing. And so she called my mom and uh, my mom was a, a lieutenant at the maximum security prison at Luther Luckett Correctional Facility in LaGrange. And um, I was going to come home that weekend. And she was like, now I go to a job that I hate every day because I don't have the education that I need. So she was like, so here's what we're going to do. You're going to go over to the prison with me and visit. So if you think school's too hard and basketball's too hard and you don't like it, she was like, you can come home, but you're going to have to find a place to live. And if you flunk out of school, you and I are going to work at the same place. And I, she literally took me in the prison. I looked around and those gates closed and you were literally in there with the inmates walking around on the concrete. And she made me stay all day. And I was like, you know what? Knoxville doesn't sound so bad. And from that point on, I got myself together, more focused. I actually graduated in three and a half years, got my master's uh, while I was still finishing up my eligibility. So see, life lessons at a young age. You talk about um, even with um, your mom, and then you talked about um, Coach Summit, which we want to get into as well. Um, But do you feel, and, and it's funny because you said, I don't want to age myself. Well, I'm 41. So I'm, when I think of, of certain times, you know, you, the, the times of which you talk about remind me of when parents were not your friends. <laughs> <laughs> they, they, uh, uh, they would actually, uh, <laughs> I had, I had parents that if you looked like you were getting ready to talk back, <laughs> if you looked like you, and when I was growing up, you would walk into a room, especially with adults, and uh, they would say, we're having a grown folk conversation. You can see yourself out. You, you better know? say it. You so, better say it again. I grew up in that era as well. Um, <laughs> the kids had their little table, and the parents had their table, and they were not to be mixed. <laughs> they that, were not. Or whatever. So do you feel, before we get to Coach Summit, do you feel that that uh, time that you were raised, the way of which the influence and the mentors and different things that you had, um, because they were invested in your your best interest and your developing of yourself, do you feel like some of that is missing now in some of the students or in some of the um, younger people that you see now um, that they might have the skills um, but didn't necessarily have the mentorship or the um, someone saying, I'm not as impressed by your gifting as I am in, uh, by making sure that you become the best version of yourself. Do you see any type of uh, difference now? Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, each generation is different. And, you know, we all had our, our strengths and weaknesses. Um, but I would say our generation, you know, forced us to be more resilient and a toughness. Um and a discipline about yourself. So as you said, you could look at somebody wrong and you were going to get a beat down. And the thing is, like, and when I was growing up, ever, I used to ask my mom, why can't everybody whoop me? And if I yes. was, was going to get a whooping across town by whoever. Yes. When I got home, I was going to get another whooping from my mama for cutting up across town. Um, but, you know, I it was a, a respect that you had for adults, but it also forced you to have a discipline um, about yourself. And then we didn't have the instant gratification. So, and it wasn't, you just get a trophy for showing you up. Participate. You, you had to actually win. And so I think we have gotten away from that a little bit. Um, and I feel like I'm that way with my son now. Like if he if he loses, you know, you you have to let them experience failure to to let them know that they can of, overcome adversity or work for what you want. So he was like he was mad. He plays um, soccer and he was like a little boy on the team had more goals. 
So I was like, well, you better get to practice. Go outside and practice. And then he went outside and practiced. And then he was like, I'm going to get more goals. I was like, well, you better practice. But today he was better than you. And so I think it's okay to let them know that you can fail. But it's the resiliency to get back up and fight and swing. And so I am uh, grateful to my mom and my mentors and people that allowed me to fail, pushed me out of my comfort zone, um, because that is life. And not just in sport, life, you are going to get knocked down and you better be able to get back up and swing. I believe that um, some people would say and have said, you know, uh, especially of our generation and before uh, that uh, or my generation before uh, they were saying that, um, you know, we were abused, we were beat, you know, when we were yeah. and I, I don't necessarily, I mean, well, some things are debatable because, you know, extension cords and, you know, yeah. and, uh, well, and switches, whatever they had in their know, hand, is you know, okay. whatever switch, got go thrown. Go switch. Go, I, 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 remember. I tell my mom, I never understood that. Why did you tell me to go get my own switch? She was like, because I needed the energy to beat you. Listen, listen. <laughs> and not only that, and then they would get mad at you if you brought the wrong <laughs> switch. Like if, if yes. the switch was not good enough, if it didn't, if it didn't pop right, they were like, go back out and get another. <laughs> Absolutely. And, you know, now that I'm a mother, I just laugh. I said, I want to say all the things that you said to me. So I was like, I never understood. You used to beat the snot out of me. And then he was like, you better quit crying before I give you something to cry Listen. about. Beat me. So I'll be able to. <laughs> and I would hate it when. The worst um, for those of you who are watching right now, don't don't stream, don't get off, don't log off. We're not I'm not glorifying those days. These are just our stories and we live to tell about it. Uh, but I remember um, I used to hate it after something, some discipline happened and then somebody would happen to stop by the house or somebody would call and then they would recount the whole story and what they did. And then they would get mad all over again. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But, you know. We love our parents and, and there is a respect uh, that you have for them and a gratefulness, um, even though in the moment we didn't always like it. We didn't always understand it, but it is an appreciation for what they were trying to do to get us ready for life. Yes. And so that's with anything you do. So I, I tell our players now. You don't like it now. You will thank us later. Yeah. And so it's so funny. So in the moment, no one likes it, right? So Coach Summit, I was like, oh, good gracious. But it wasn't until after I left the University of Tennessee and was on my own. I was like, oh, this makes sense. I have a new appreciation for it. I understand um, what Coach was trying to do. Uh, to get us ready. So it's funny because now when the former players, they leave Kentucky and then they call back, they were like, this makes sense. But it's not until you get away and you have time to reflect on um, things that you went through um, during your journey that you're like, oh yeah, this makes sense now. Playing under such a legendary coach like Coach Summit, how was that experience that now, yes, you say you look back on it um, and you say that all makes sense. Um, what are some of the, I mean, there's probably too many to even name. We don't have time, but some of the top lessons that you're just like, I hate it when it happened. Now I look back and I'm like, you know, now, you know, it makes complete sense. Well, there are so many stories and I get so emotional talking about coach summit, but you know, I would say some of the top takeaways that she pushed you to greatness. The standard was the standard and she wasn't going to allow you to accept anything lower than your best. And that's something that you needed for the court to be successful, but you also need it for life. And so I feel like now I'm an extreme type A perfectionist. I want the best. And even though I fall short a lot, but I'm striving for greatness in area er, in every area of my life. And then the second thing, surround yourself with good people 
and the people that are aligned to you um, that can challenge you to be better, that can inspire you to be better, that can check you and be like, no, this ain't where you need to be. Uh, You need to get with it. So people that are wanting to see you be great and you want to see them be great as well. Yeah, that part there where you said, (laughs) I almost felt like the kids, that part uh, where you said uh, surround yourself with people who want to see you uh, great or uh, want to. In fact, when did you do you feel like you made a decision at some point to surround yourself with people um, that continue to push you towards greatness or were trying to be great themselves? Or do you feel like life made the decision for you to be around people that would um, uh, force you or move you into greatness? Um, I think it's a mix of both. Um, I think I was always kind of cognitive of who I surrounded myself with. Uh, you know, my family was big, always big, like you're guilty by association. So whoever you associate yourself with is how people perceive you. Um, but I also think life you know, you grow up, you experience different things. Um, And the older that I have become, the smaller your circle. And when you start looking around at your circle, um, you know, it's people that you go, that you trust that are in the trenches and that they are all encompassing of what you're trying to achieve in your life. And you can do that for them um, as well. So I think life forces you uh, to make some decisions and um, you might lose some friends along the way and you might not necessarily some some you lose and some you're friends but you're friends from a distance you you know you I, I still love you but you're not going in the direction that I'm headed and you have to you you have to distinguish who those people are and that you need in your life so for me at this juncture in my life it's only people um, that can encourage, inspire, impact, influence, who can say the tough things in order to get me to where I'm trying to go. So I want to ask you this because you said something that made me want to lead into this. And this is not something I plan to ask, but I hope that I can word it in a way that it will make sense. How does it how do you navigate the space of being a walking billboard where when people see you, it's not as a person sometimes or as a human being, it is as a brand or as a whatever. So that's where though that circle comes from, you know, people who can oftentimes bring you back down or to level you out, you know, that they're not looking the people that you have around you are not necessarily looking to get anything from you. They they just know you for who you are. So how, how do you navigate that space of being a billboard everywhere you go? It, it's interesting. I will say, um, but I've never been that person. I feel like I always try to remain humble, um, you know, as easy as they, you know, gave it to me, they can take it away. And so I just try to put my head down and grind, Um, treat people like I've always treated them uh, with love and respect and kindness. And I um, expect the same thing. Uh, But it is uh, kind of a weird feeling to see yourself up on billboards and, you know, people kind of looking and talking to you. uh, Because when I see myself, I see the little country girl from Odom County, Kentucky, that God just blessed me with an opportunity to walk in my purpose. So for me, I don't see myself any different. I still talk to the same people that I normally talk to before I got the job. Um, I still have my same routine. Um, I haven't done anything extra. So for me, I still see myself as a normal person. Someone, a great, um, a great pastor, influential pastor in the nation, um, who everybody would know if I made name this, I named him, but he said one time, someone asked him a question and I was in the room and he said, um, to them, he said, how do you 
balance success. You have this, you have this, you have this and all this stuff. How do you balance that and live in that space? You know, how is it to be successful? And uh, he responded and said, I don't see myself the way you see. He said, you're assuming that I view myself as successful. He said, because while I'm sitting here, I'm also not with my children. So I'm failing with my children because I'm sitting with you. And while I'm talking to you, I'm failing in my business because there's emails that are coming through that I can't respond to. He said, so every day I'm balancing the success that you see and the failure that I know. So you said something very important when you kept saying, I see myself as whatever. Um, And do you believe that um, a perspective of you um, it's always necessary to navigate the different spaces, you know, because a lot of people um, I've heard many people say often that the stage or the spotlight, uh, be careful of trying to run towards it, because all it does is illuminate what you already are. Uh, so do you feel that the areas of which you were already grounded in um, have only um, in an other sense helped you dig deeper into what you already were so that you don't get caught up or or moved by any of it? Right. I, and I think you, you have to remain steady, not too high, not too low, because one thing about being in the spotlight, there are a lot of people for you and there are a lot of people that are not. And you have to be able to deal with both. And I think that's surrounding yourself with the circle is extremely important because there's days that they have to pick you up. And then there's days that they're like, OK, good job. You you did a great job at this. And You said it best. It's a balance of who you are, Um, because I am the head women's coach at the University of Kentucky, but I'm also a wife. I'm also a mother. I'm also a sister. I'm also a daughter. So, you know, being able to manage all those compartments of your life. Now, that's the challenge. Yeah. Um, You know, I would say just remain. um steadfast in God, uh, staying in the word, uh, a lot of exercise, um, and quite honestly, a lot of counseling, uh, you know, which people see as a stigma, especially in our community, but it also gives you a space to let out any of the feelings that you're thinking. So those are the things and self-care. Those are the things that kind of keep me balanced when the life around me is extremely chaotic and when everyone needs a piece of you, how I I try to stay my whole self. Yeah, I say often, I thank God for God and counseling, both. Um, I thank him for his word and I thank God for a couch (laughs) that I can have a conversation and um, it is something that people when you go to counseling I've had many uh, people who have been in my life when I talk about counseling will say so what's wrong with you I'm like there's nothing wrong I'm just trying to make sure nothing goes wrong I'm I'm fine I just need I, I can't be the be all end all for everyone and have no outlet. I have to be able to sit and just talk about. And sometimes in counseling, you don't even know what you're thinking about until they, someone asks you the question and you be like, Oh, I didn't even know that was on my mind, you know? So, um, so I'm so glad that you answered it in that way. And, um, that, um, I'm glad you go to counseling because listen, <laughs> listen, I'm glad. Um, my counselor is one of my best friends. Thank you. A couch. Yes. You need an outlet. And, you know, I, I want to tell people, like you said, it doesn't mean something's wrong, You, but you don't want to get in a place that you cannot recover from. Yeah, absolutely. And and what happens sometimes when people get to certain uh, areas or platforms or levels, um, people love to um, dehumanize you in a way that you're no longer human, that you are this entity or this this. Um, this um, 
star, you know, whatever, like this big, this hero uh, of sorts that you can't break. And then when you do break, they're like, oh, I wonder why they broke. I wonder what happened to them. You know, like y'all drove me insane. You know, so, so yes, counseling can help all of that. I want to ask you because you've alluded to it a few times and um, about God and the word and faith. How has your faith um, been played out in your career in um, a space that doesn't call for it? Um, that doesn't always celebrate it. Um, you're not, coaches are not always saying, let's pray, you know, before we go out, you know, it is not the requirement or any way. How had, has your faith had to be, or how have you displayed it or even um, had to rely or fall back on it in so many different spaces that you've been in? Well, you know, I grew up at a young age in church, gave my life to Christ and, it has always been my foundation. Uh, my mother has a praying wall. She's on with her friends at 6 a.m. So it's something that I have known, you know, my whole life. And But obviously, as you get older, you grow with God in a different way um, that's compatible for you. And I just think, you know, that life happens. It forces you, even in this business, you know, everyone sees the game day or the big wins, um, and it, it is a very rewarding job, but you sacrifice a lot, time away from your family, the emotional highs, the emotional lows, um, and, you know, God just keeps you steady, and I have been blessed that I have been in programs that we have celebrated our Christianity, so that's it's been a blessing for me. Um, and even though it's not something that we publicize all the time, you know, we are in a space that if they choose, um, so our players are like, let's have Bible study. It's not a mandatory, but that's what they choose to do. Um, you know, we pray before practice. Now we talk, you know, to each individual. If you would like to step out of the circle, feel free. But majority of the time, this is how they were raised. But I think you recruit players um, that are kind of aligned in the foundation, even though, but sport is funny. It crosses all barriers, race, culture, religion, political background, but sport brings us together. So I think we are a unique group of people because of the diversity. Um, so I think we can incorporate um, some of the religious backgrounds without forcing it on people. Um, but usually we let our players step forward first. Tell me some funny story about you growing up, playing basketball and showing up a guy. I'm just assuming that there is a story because there's always this competition and this competitive nature of like you can't show me up you okay and you know I just know that you show somebody up and their face is cracked and they're still thinking about it <laughs> well you know uh it, it is funny the fifth grade in fifth grade when I was playing basketball um they were supposed to have um like a girls team and a guys team where there were not enough girls to play um, so I had to play with the boys, but nobody wanted me on their team, um, at first because I was the girl, um, and our first game out. Now I grew up, mind you, my family is very athletic. Everybody plays sports. We beat each other up. So I grew up playing with my older cousins who would send me in the house crying. And my mom was like, if you're going to be out there playing with the guys, uh, your cousins, you better get tough. Um, so that's how I grew up playing. So in fifth grade, when I was playing with those guys, I was like, well, I've grown up doing this. They didn't know that. And so I got on the court and I killed that first game. And um, after that, all the boys asked me to play on their team, but I was like, no, I'm sticking with the team uh, that they put me on. And so one of the sheriffs in my hometown, I did a Rotary Club uh, engagement with them. And he said, I still remember you coaching fifth grade. You showed my son's team up 
And I think the boys uh, all wanted you to play with them all through high school, even when in sixth grade we went with the, the girls. But so, you know, it's funny. You never judge a book by its cover because, you know, girls rule. Growing up, who was your favorite team professionally? What was your favorite team professionally? The Lakers. Okay. And you could, I loved the Chicago Bulls as well and Michael Jordan. Now, now which team of the Chicago Bulls? Which one? I mean, which, they're all. Which, I know, I know, group, but that's the same air. Scotty Pippen. Yeah. Uh, Dennis Rodman, Michael Jordan, Paxton. Yeah. So yeah. that group. Okay. I mean, I figured so. I just want to make sure you know that uh, uh, that we're on the same page. That's that's when it was good. Yes, yes. And while I like the Lakers, um, Magic Johnson. I mean, how can you not love him? I mean, he was a big guard, and uh, he could pass the ball. The Showtime, the Flash. You know, you can't go wrong with Magic. Yeah. Now, in WNBA, when you start to see it evolve and develop and it's continued to evolve and develop and much better than it was and still has a long way to go, um, who were you even inspired by just looking at them, you know, being able to develop and evolve? You know, the WNBA, I'm just so proud for women's sports and how far we have come. We still have a long way to go, um, but these women have taken a stand. They have really the um, professional sports on a platform and I am to God be the glory um, that, you know, women have something to, to uh, reach for after college. Um, But growing up, you know, we didn't have the WNBA to look for. So it was the college. Um, And it's funny, Dawn Staley was my all time favorite. She was all over my room, the posters. I had the rubber band around my wrist. Um, She was the end all be all. And it was so funny when she got the job at South Carolina, my mom called me and she was like, your girl is coming to the SEC. I was like, I know. And it wasn't, um, it was probably my first or second summer after she was uh, hired at South Carolina. I sat next to her and I was like, we're competitors now. However, I was like, I want to thank you. I was like, you were my childhood idol growing up. I said, I had you everywhere. And we had the same number. And I knew I was just going to be the next Don Staley. And she just looked at me and smiled. She she thought I was joking, but I was serious. And we played uh, at the All-American game in Philadelphia. And she came and spoke to our group. And probably like a week ago, I sent her that picture when I was a senior in high school and she spoke to the All-American. But, you know, sports gives us an opportunity to change the narrative, to give girls hope that you can reach for the stars. Yeah, yeah, that's good. So this is a segment that I end with uh, called On the Spot. So this is not anything that you have to think about or prepare for. It's just whatever comes. So before games, what is your music of choice? What are you uh, listening go- to? Gospel. Okay. Tasha Cobb. Yes. Gospel. She saved y'all. She saved for real. <laughs> you know my name. That's, that's- so if we go to your car right now. Tasha Cobbs is playing in your in your uh, uh, Bluetooth when it comes on. Tasha Cobbs is playing. Or you got somebody else playing in the car. Now you said before the game. I know. Now, now I'm switching. And now I'm saying in the car. Now. Oh, in the car, it's a mix. Now I'm an old school R and B lover, uh, so I might have a Ti playing. I might have Keisha Cole. Um, if I mix it up, it might be Cardi B because okay. Up is one of my favorite songs. So I'm a mix. It depends on the mood that I'm in. Okay. All right. When the cameras are off and the spotlight is not on you, what is your favorite thing to do or eat? 
my favorite thing to do is watch reality uh, TV. Ratchet or what? Say it again. I said ratchet, uh, ratchet uh, reality TV or um, or uh, uh, what? Extreme Homemakers TV. Are you watching Housewives of Atlanta or what? Now, I don't fool with the Housewives of Atlanta. However, I watch my 600 pound life. I watch Seeking Sister Wives. I watch uh, Hoarders. So, I mean, I'm I'm across the board. I just like reality TV, keeping up with the Kardashians. Okay. And their season is ending, I think. So, yes. here's a million dollar question. Do you put sugar on grits? I don't like grits. So I <laughs> sugar. Or salt or anything else in between because I don't like them. So uh, don't, don't worry. Eat either. You know, everybody I judges them. me. See, I'm a cream of wheat type of chick. Oh, Lord. People like have already logged off. Cheaper. Some people logged off like, no, no, no. <laughs> don't no. log off. How, don't log off now. I just, I just don't like them. However, if you want me to pick a meal, I'm going soul food all day, every day. Give me the fried. I'm a meat and potato type of girl. Give me the fried chicken, the collard greens, sweet potato, macaroni cheese, hot hungry. water bread. I'm hungry. Cook- or the sweet tea with all the sugar. I'm hungry. I'm hungry. I'm hungry. And wait, I got to finish it off. Well, my uh, grandma is deceased now, but she used to make me a lemon meringue with the perfect meringue. Um, and then my so makes a yellow cake, homemade yellow cake with caramel icing. That's now that I just got saved all over again. Now that there, I said, okay, <laughs> see, I had to rebound from the grid. So that there is like old school Women's Day, Mother's uh, Mother's uh, Women's Day, uh, Men's Day uh, after church meal. <laughs> That's where everybody's eating it. That's downstairs. Now you said all those things. The question is, can you cook those things? No. You just eat them. <laughs> I just eat them. But listen, this is what I tell my husband. Everybody has a role, right? And everybody play your role to your strength. Yeah. And so I coach basketball for a living. I'm playing to my strength. Now, if you want me to make you any type of breakfast, I got you. I make amazing pancakes, eggs, bacon, any type of breakfast that you would like. Uh and then I make a mean spaghetti. It's really good. I can do that. Now, other than that, I can pick up whatever you want. Yes, um, that's so funny. That's, that's what my husband's for. He does all the cooking. So the players, they don't ask me, do I want to cook for him? They ask him, and then he cooks them all the meals. That is so funny. You said I, However, can, pick, I can pick up whatever you need. <laughs> I can pick up whatever you like. I, I, I got you covered. Now, my strength is now, now when they run me out of coaching, if you need a personal assistant, if you need your closet organized, I mean, it will be color coded down to the science. It will be organized. If you need your pantry, if you need your house decorated, I got you. I'm your girl. What is right? Uh, what is currently on your nightstand? A lot of books. Okay. I read a lot. Of books. Okay. I asked somebody that one time before. They said, "I'm not going to lie. There's a lot of books, but I'm not reading any of them." <laughs> yes, I read a lot of books, um, and I do self help books. I like uh, romantic books. I just finished with Mariah Carey, who's one of my all time favorite artists, um, and her book was amazing. Um, I am currently reading uh president obama's book so promised land I yeah i knew that uh mariah had a book i just hadn't i hadn't read it um so but i'm not ever unfortunately i've never really been interested in her life so i just have never read it so uh but i love her she's great she, but i just i didn't i never thought to read the book so maybe i do need to because you said you it. It, it it explains why she acts the way she does it's funny how your childhood really shapes who you oh. are Absolutely. Now, Mariah, now she is one of my all time favorites now. So you're talking about Starstruck. So um, 
one of my best friends, her uh, childhood friend is a background singer for Carrie. And so I had been asking her, when am I going to get to meet Mariah Carey? Like, before I leave this earth, I must meet Mariah Carey. And so we were out in Vegas. I had went to one of her concerts in New York. We were in Vegas. And they told me after the show, let's go walk in this room. So I was like, guys, I was like, I'm hungry. Let's go. In walks Mariah Carey. I literally, I'm usually never too starstruck. I literally just about died. So they didn't give me any preparation. So I'm standing there speechless and I just could not believe it. And so it was my husband, one of my best friends, uh, her friend, and I'm standing. And so I always thought about what I would say when I met Mariah Carey in my mind. Like I love Hero. I love all these songs. And nothing, and I mean nothing came to mind. And the only thing I could say was, I love you. And I gave her a hug. And they still give me heck about it to this day. So we walked out. I got my pictures with and everything. We walked out. My husband was like, really? That's all you had was I love you? And I was like, I couldn't think of anything else. I love you. That's all that came out. He was like, you sat and had a conversation with President Obama. You have met a lot of famous people and that's all you had? I was like, that's all I had. I love you. Now let's take this picture. That's all I had. Well, it was true. You do. I do. I love her. That, but you know. That is so funny. That is so funny. But I, I don't know if I were in similar positions. I don't know what I would say either. Uh, I've always, Patty LaBelle is my go-to. I've always said before she leaves this earth, please, I want to meet her. Um, uh, I said the same thing about Cicely Tyson. Um, her and Guy had other plans, so that didn't happen. So, uh, but if I were to meet him, I don't know what I would say. I would probably just be like, "Hi." <laughs> no, I, I had no words. I, I literally, and he was like, "I've never seen you speechless," which I'm usually not. And I was, I had nothing. But I love you. Yeah, that's good. That's very good. What is your post-COVID trip? Post-COVID, well, my husband and I are going to celebrate 10 years next August. Congratulations. Listen, I'm going to help you in advance. You don't have to think about it. I want to be in Bora Bora laying in a hut Hmm. with our friends and family. So a year and some change to plan in advance. Okay, very good. All right. Well, that's what's going to happen. That's what it's going to be. Well, um, before we end, the season is upon us, and um, I want to make sure that everybody who's watching gets a ticket and that they're sitting in the stands. Uh, Can you tell us uh, anything about what we're going to be expecting this season? I know it's going to be a great game. Um, I know that there's going to be some great coaching going on, and um, we need to be there. We need to be in the seats, especially all of you who are watching or listening right now, and you are in Kentucky. If you need to fly in and you're from another state, you need to fly in because there's no better seats than the seats that are going to be sat in during these games. So tell us whatever we need to know about the games and where people can get their tickets, you know, to I'm sure um, there might be some room. I mean, some of y'all might be in the bleachers because it's already sold out, but I want to make sure the rest of y'all can get some some tickets. Yes, please come see us in Memorial Coliseum. Um, our team is extremely talented. Ryan Howard is the face of our program. Uh, She is projected to be a number one draft pick. You do not want to miss her. Um, We are up-tempo. We are fast-paced. We are a hustle team. Um, And this team is trying to get to the next level. So come see us, Memorial Coliseum. We are trying to sell 5,000 season tickets I want to see each and every one of you all at the game. Let's pack pack out Memorial, be loud, make the opponents dread coming to play at the University of Kentucky. Uh, Call uh, UKAthletics.com. You can get online or call the ticket office at the University of Kentucky, and they will get you squared away with your tickets. Before we leave today, my um, as I said, I started. I'm in the same way I started. <clears throat> that um, 
I am a novice when it comes to sports, um, but I support them. Uh, one, because my children are, um, of course, active and my youngest son, who is 14 now, and he plays basketball. Uh, he does not get that from me. That's all his mom. So um <laughs> I take no credit for it. Um, they have a joke in the house all the time. They say, well, what if he ever gets picked up? They said, what are you going to do? They say, you're just going to be standing there. Like you're going to be sitting at the games. I said, if the Jumbotron ever has my picture there, I mean, they ever put me out there, I'd just be sitting there. Like I normally do supporting and um, excited for him, even though I don't know what's going on, but I'm going to be sitting there. I'm going to be there. So whatever, I'm there. So I will never be the absent dad, but I will be there. So for those people, students or um, those players who are either they're listening to you um, to just kind of hear how you think as a coach, um, as well as those who are in what I would call the second chair, who are not in the coaching position, um, that have a dream. Um, what would you say to them as our parting words, you know, that those who are listening on both sides, the student, the players, as well as those who are in the second seat, what would you say to them uh, that are listening? I would say dream big. The sky is truly uh, the limit. Um Get ready. So when your name or number is called, you are truly ready. Um, Be willing to work. Um, Hard work does pay off. And uh, the last thing I would say, find what your passion is and do it well. Well, y'all, y'all heard it here. You heard it live. You heard it first here on uh, the Think It Out Loud podcast. Thank you all. Thank you so much. I appreciate you. Thank you for doing this. And um, uh, y'all follow her. Yes. Let me know. We'll let everybody know. Y'all are going to let me in without asking her where to follow you. Let let them know where to follow you. Please follow me. I need to get my followers followers up uh, at UK Coach. The letters L and Z. I will see you on social media. That is my Twitter um, account handle and my Instagram, Facebook. You can follow me at Kyra LZ. Are you on TikTok? I am not. I- I'm going to get Thank there. you again for I'm tuning in. There. Remember to like, All right, subscribe. Y'all follow or do it right now. Great this podcast wherever you're listening to it or comment if you're watching this on youtube and remember to share it with whoever you know needs to hear it until next time breathe in be the best version that you can be everybody else is taken and remember to embrace your own unique design i promise you somebody needs you see you soon We don't